Welcome to another edition of Women Making Waves. I'm Paula Chow. Today, my guest is Kang Yi Chen, a Yale University professor. When Taiwan was under the White Terror era from 1949 to 1987, Chen's father was in prison for 10 years. But did he do anything illegal? Why did the head of the police department, Mr. Gu, take him away? He knew that my father was innocent. However, my father had a temper. And he offended him, and he just couldn't help it. He sentenced him to ten years, and he said the same kind of fate happened to many youngsters at the time. A couple years ago, Chen published a memoir giving a detailed account of how her family managed to survive during the hardships and finally moved to the U.S. But different from other survivors who are filled with resentment and are strongly critical of the KMT administration, Chen chose to focus on gratitude. First of all,、um, my book is not supposed to be a political book, and I'm not a political person. I just never wanted to think about all these in terms of the political context. This is a book about soul searching and the healing of a childhood trauma. Because I wrote from the perspective of. A child. I was very, very honest in terms of recollection.、Uh, I, this is about my personal history, about how I view the whole thing. I have to admit that when I was younger, you know, I mean, younger than nine years old, I was very, very resentful, you know, because I saw what happened to our family. It, it was like a sudden change of fate. I was very sad, but I think somehow religion saved me. Yeah,、uh, as you can see from my book, I one day I just walk into a church and and I got a message、um, about something which is just totally different. You know, from from what I. I, I was thinking before, you know, the, the fact that that you should love your enemy or something. For some reason, I was just very relieved, and also because I simply bury myself in books, and I just feel that this is just like my personal journey. It doesn't mean that that I'm totally blind to the political circumstances. And when I say that I'm grateful, it's not because I'm grateful for this misfortune, but I'm grateful for those friends and relatives who were so, so selfless. You know, who were so kind to us. Your parents also chose、um, forgiveness.、Mm-hmm. Uh, did that also have something to do with their religious beliefs? I think so. I think the fact that that they both became Christians at different times that gave them a different perspectives on on their lives. And also, it is for a very realistic and practical reason. If you are Full of hatred, you're going to die young. You know, it is not a very good thing for someone to keep thinking about the past. If they are obsessed with hatred, you know, it's just a miserable life. The other reason is because they went to the United States, you know, to stay after 1978, and their life changed, right? So they were actually very grateful that somehow, you know, they kind of transcended the past. It doesn't mean that that they. They totally forgot about the past, but I think religion is a very powerful thing.、Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to to explain.、Mm-hmm. It's very personal. When Mr. Gu, the policeman, took her father away in 1950, his original plan was to arrest her mother also. But it was Chan, who was less than six years old at that time, stopped him from doing that. When I saw that. He was going to do that. I simply went in and and got a a, a piece of wood, you know, trying to to、um, you know hit him. He was kind of upset, and and later he knelt down and said, "Well, you know, I know how you feel. I'm not going to take your mother away."、Um, and that was Mr. Gu, and Mr. Gu actually reminded me of that in 1977 when I visited him. I was not going to. Challenge him or anything. He was like my enemy, right? But at the same time, he also helped us because every time when my brothers or me wanted to go to the United States, you know, like for example, when we got the visa and the passport, but then we were not allowed to go out, he would help us because he knew that my father was innocent. So that was a very complex man. He did so much, so many bad things to people, but at the same time, he did that to us too. 
When your father was in prison, how often did your、um, mother take you and your two younger brothers to visit him? About once a year. About once a year. Yeah, because it was very difficult. You know, from in those days, from Kaohsiung to to Taipei, it took many many hours to do so. And my mother was busy, and and also because of her financial problems, we just simply could not afford to do that. So like once a year. But then when he was in Green Island, we did not see him at all. We actually did not see him until he came back from the Green Island. That was like the first time I saw him. Well, it was three years after he was arrested. You talk about、um, financial problems. I know that your mother taught a sewing class. Was that the only source of income? How many students did she have, and how often、um, did she teach that class? She taught the class all the time. It was a continuous class. Some students were more advanced, and some students were just newcomers. And then she had a system, you know, just to make sure that every time、um, there were like at least twenty students, and that was the only source of. Income. We were very poor, and I kept getting fellowships, you know, scholarships, and and that's why I said I was very grateful. I was very grateful to teachers, you know, like Mr. Lan, you know, who was really very selfless, and he helped us a lot. Yeah, it, it was difficult. How has the childhood、um, trauma affected your adolescence? Your attitudes towards life, and even your、um, two younger brothers. I think this childhood trauma. You know, I did not know that this, this was childhood trauma when I was younger. Of course, it was only later. You know, when I look back and、I、read books about childhood trauma, and I realized that that I was, of course, deeply affected by this trauma. Most of the problems were the linguistic problem, because when I first came. Came to Taiwan. My first language was the Beijing Hua, you know, this Peking dialect.、Um, and then when when my father was taken to the prison, when my mother and us we we you know we escaped to to South Taiwan. I think I just forgot the, that first language in a matter of days, and then I only spoke Taiwanese, you know, for for a long time, until like two years after that, I started to learn the Taiwanese、uh, Mandarin. That gave me a lot of problem. You know, I I talk about that in my book, how I was being、uh, looked down upon, you know, by by students from the mainland China, and I had this kind of. Identical crisis because I was a Mandarin, but at the same time I was talking in this Taiwanese、um, language, well, actually kind of accented language. It was a very painful experience. It was only after I went to the U.S. you know that I overcome this, and it seems that my brothers, you know, two brothers had different kind of trauma. My middle brother, you know, Casey. Who, who, who was almost like autistic? It was not autistic, but kind of social autism. He refused to talk. He he was a very excellent student in class, but he never wanted to talk. So I think it took him a long time, many years, you know, to overcome that. And the youngest brother probably had the least trauma because he was so young. He was only 18 months old. He did not understand what was going on, so he simply grew up in in that kind of environment. I think he had the least trauma. After your father was released,、um, the police still came、um, every once in a while to do what they call the household、uh, registration checks. What exactly did the police want? I don't think I know what they wanted, you know, because they would come and knock at the door in the middle of the night, you know, like two o'clock a.m., three o'clock a.m., and say, "Okay, I wanted to check, you know, how many people you have in the household. Okay, where are your two brothers?" And then, of course, my two brothers sometimes they were with my my relatives in Zhuoying, you know, the, the Gaoxiong. I think they just wanted to frighten us. You know, wanted to show us some kind of、um, power. You know, implying that、um, you are released from the prison, but but we are we are still watching you. You know, they probably wanted to give us a statement, but it was really painful. Whenever they came, the relatives would be alert, and it was just a very painful experience. 
when your father was in prison, he wrote a letter to your mother saying that you know she should find someone else and remarry, and your mother was very angry. Was that quite common? You know, some political prisoners would do that, something like that. I think it is common, right? Because most political prisoners at the time knew that. It would be a long experience, and it would be so difficult for the wife to survive. And in fact, many, I think, probably most of those wives were were remarry. Most, most, I mean, I mean, from the kind of books that I read in recent years, I realized that that was a very common thing. And in fact, I heard. Well, I also read about it. Like, for example, sometimes、um, the wives. Would go to the prison to visit the husband, just to tell the husband that they had to get a divorce, and to to ask the prisoner, you know, the husband, to sign the paper, because it was so hard for them to continue to live. It was a very practical problem. So most、uh, political prisoners, when they came out after 15 years, 20 years. Well, they realize that they have lost their fortune, everything, their wife. They have to start everything from the beginning. Yeah. So I think my my parents' experience is very unusual. Yeah. For Chen and her family, it was a miracle to be able to survive during the White Terror era. They stayed away from politics and chose to remain silent. When I remain silent, it's not because of someone's、uh, order, you know, command that I have to remain silent. Part of it is self-censorship, right? Because I was afraid. I knew that the only survival for me is to get out of Taiwan. From a very young age, I know I realized that to go to the U.S. Is, was the only way out. So I, well, I wanted to keep quiet so that there was no problem. I would not invite any problem. And I think for my parents, their concern was that if you talk about something, it could be a very dangerous thing for your children. Part of it is really self-censorship. That was Kang Yichen. The author of *Journey Through the White Terror*, for women making waves. I'm Paula Chow. Bye bye.